I'd like to open the third session of this conference and the last one for today. Uh, titled Clandestine Convertors. The first speaker of this session, Karsten Wilke, is an associate professor at the Department of History and Medieval Studies of Central European University in Budapest, where he serves as director where he serves as director of the Center for Religious Studies. His research explores the social and intellectual interaction of Jews and their non-Jewish environment in medieval and modern Europe. Among his recent book publications are the Marrakesh Dialogue, a Gospel Critique and Jewish Apology from the Spanish Renaissance, published by Brio 2014, Histoire de Juif Portugais, of which second edition was published in 2015 by Chandet, and Farewell to Shulamit, Spatial and Social Diversity in the Song of Songs, the Goiter 2017. He also co-edited the volumes Antonio Enriquez Gomez, Un Poeta Entre Santos and Judaizentes, Reichenberger 2015, and Modern Jewish Scholarship in Hungary, Science of Judaism Between East and West, the Goiter 2016, with Tamash Turan. The title of his talk today, Discrete Disputes, Catholics and Jewish Proselytizers Among Portuguese Merchants of the 17th Century France. You'll see. Thank you. Thank you very much for this kind introduction. And uh, I would like to extend a, uh, a warm thank you to the organizers of this conference, and uh, Chaim in particular, who gave me the opportunity uh, to speak here. And uh, I also thank all of you who have expressed uh, concerns and support for my besieged uh, university. We uh, very much need your solidarity. So uh, what I will, uh, my, my talk will lead us to a very specific, uh, peculiar environment, the world of the clandestine uh, Jews in France in the 17th uh, century. Indeed, the forced conversion of most Iberian Jews in the late Middle Ages had important consequences for Jewish and general history during the early modern period. One of these, the appearance of an extreme degree of internal diversification, presents a novelty in pre-modern Jewish um, religious history. The incomplete integration of tens of thousands of new Christians in Iberian societies, their uh, persecution by the Inquisition and their emigration abroad produced in an untimely fragmentation of religious affiliations that elsewhere is only a hallmark of modernity. A large gamut of uh, intermediary stages appears, including individuals uh, who show a considerable mobility of affiliations during their lives, among others who practice both religions at the same time, and others still who do not identify with either of them. The individualistic and opportunistic attitudes towards religious choices remind of the fuzzy religious identities of the secular age, but they appear and develop in a social world that insisted on confessional belief and belonging more strongly than ever. A particularly intriguing case of instable uh, individual and collective identities can be found among the new Christian settlement in France during the half century that I will look at between 1620 and 1670. At the time, the public practice of Judaism was banned from the French kingdom, but its private exercise was not repressed by an inquisition as it was on the Iberian Peninsula. The small but powerful merchant network uh, of the Portuguese nation, numbering about 2,000 individuals in the mid-17th century, thus included members of all stripes Immigrants from the Iberian countries, many of them fully integrated into the Catholic religion. Migrants from Italy and from the Netherlands, many of them already grown up in Jewish communities, alongside various local traditions of semi-clandestine Judaism. While the Portuguese settlements around Bayonne in the southwest, the extreme southwest, arrived at a fairly traditional practice, the merchant colonies in Bordeaux and in Rouen, on which this paper will focus, were split between Catholic and Judaizing members. Neither of both factions did produce many extant writings on their religious life, and we would be at a loss to reconstruct it without the rich archives of the Spanish Inquisition that constantly spied upon the heretic manifestations across its northern border. The inquisitorial sources on French culture Judaism were first explored in the 60s by E.S. Reva and Julio Caro Barroja, 
The research was uh, continued by a number of uh, researchers, uh, among them uh, David Graysport. Uh, Graysport ob observed that the manifold religious changes between the Jewish and Christian orthodoxies were the effect of social conditioning rather than doct doctrinal uh, persuasion, but that uh, uh, inquisitorial texts tended to attribute them to an autonomous cognitive process responding to teaching by others, by agents. When imagining the secret Judaism among Judeo-converts, Catholic theology followed its own dogmatic constraints. Crypto-Judaism was not an ethnic substrate, but a deviant attitude inside Christianity. Return to the church was, uh, was not properly speaking a conversion, but a reduction from heresy defined in scholastic terms as an error of understanding. That's heresy in uh, scholastic vision. On the inquisitive, inquisitive side, there was therefore a doctrinal interest in separating communities on the basis of their doctrinal credo and in constructing the passages between them as a cognitive process. In the inquisitorial interrogatories, defendants had to confess their Judaizing heresy as a narrative that started inevitably with a perversion through a heresiarch called the Insinu in, uh, in Portuguese, which continued through the series of declarations between like-minded individuals and which ended with a drama of the individual reduction uh, <coughs> to the true faith. Most defendants in inquisitorial trial records thus elaborated two conversions. Uh, and named two agents responsible of the double transformation that had taken place in their religious psychology. We can therefore study thousands of cases in which the heretic describes the agent of his or her conversion, the circumstances and content of this heretic uh, teaching and scene. Defendants seem to choose carefully the person to whom they attribute the role of the Jewish dogmatizer, luring them into apostasy. The first rule seems to be that one avoided denouncing persons living in Portugal or Spain under the jurisdiction of the Inquisition. Second, defendants often seem to avoid accusing deceased relatives, which obviously would put the family heritage at risk. From an overview of inquisitorial interrogatories, it seems that the idol corrupter was a stranger who had already deceased or emigrated at the time when the declaration was made. João de Moraes, for example, declared in 1650 that he was introduced to the Jewish faith in Andalusia at age six by, I quote, a Portuguese stranger named Pedro Lopes Henriquez, who arrived from Antequera to the family home in Alcalá La Real and converted his entire family so efficiently that they all celebrated the Jewish festival together just one day after the teaching. Sometimes the agent of conversion appears particularly learned and knowledgeable. Francisco López Villanueva declares that he met in Bordeaux in 1642 a former Franciscan friar, the licentiate Villa Escusa, who told him that he was circumcised and talked him into embracing Judaism, giving, I quote, many thoughts and reasons in praise of the law of Moses. To the prospective follower of the law of Moses, the Jewish corrupter sometimes offers money and sometimes a marriageable daughter, but most frequently he appears with a tra translation of the Bible in hand. The already named João de Moraes was sent in 1645 before his marriage from Perorad in the southwest uh, corner of France to Bordeaux, where he met two rabbis, he says, from Venice and argued with them about the Spanish Bible of Ferrara for 40 days, ultimately rejecting the Jewish interpretation with the help of quotes from the Vulgate. Fernau Enriquez da Vega, who arrived around 1651 in Bayonne, attributed the task of the corrupter to a certain Don Duarte Cardoso, who also presented the Ferrara Bible to him. As Fernau saw that the book was printed with a license by the Holy Office, he read it, and let himself be gained for Judaism by the others. If a prisoner of the Inquisition had confessed the initiation to the Judaizing heresy, they also had to depict a second conversion which brought them to repentance shortly before they made their declarations. Since the reconversion to Christianity needed to be placed between the arrest and the interrogatory, 
An illumination by the Holy Spirit in the prison cell is the most common element of the confession. Sometimes the cleric who had visited the defendant in the prison, prison or a book that he had been given to read would become the focus of the reconversion drama. One of Gray's words examples, Diego de Lima, presents the most common variant when he claimed that the study of Fray Luis de Granada's introduction to the Credo, the book of 1583, a summary of the church doctrine, including an anti-Jewish chapter, this book had brought him back to Catholicism. Francisco Luis Enriquez de Mora describes that he was converted by the joint effort of two Jesuits who kept him prisoner in uh, Peru, where he was arrested after having lived as a crypto Jew in France. Uh, one of the two, uh, two fathers had told him in words of wisdom that God loved him and that he should be patient in his suffering, and the other father had given him Fray Luis' introduction, and the joint impression did not fail to have the desired effect, so that he returned Lujo, to the faith in Christ. In other words, the inquisitorial declarations on the persons that instigated the defendant's changes of religion responded to a common scheme that reproduced the story that the inquisitors, inquisitors wanted to be told. While Gray's board vigorously argues in favor of the reliability of these conversion stories, I would not be so optimistic. The kernel of truth behind these declarations is the fact that Catholic and Jewish New Christians did argue with each other in the French settlements of the Portuguese emigration, and that in these environments of unstable religious affiliations, just as in post-Reformation Europe generally, every believer could transmute into a missionary, and any such conversion could be endowed from hindsight with a formative conversion experience. We get a good glimpse of these uh, layman's dogmatic from an encounter that Paulo Saraiva had in Bordeaux around 1619 to 1620, when one of the local Portuguese, João Luís Guimarães, uh, urged him to confess the law of Moses, Saraiva, a Catholic, responded by affirming his faith in Jesus, Jesus Christ as the Messiah. Guimarães emphatically replied that Christians were believing in the wrong Messiah, whereas Jews believe in the real one, who was St. John the Baptist. Mm -hmm. Saraiva laughed aloud about this answer and explained to his Jewish interlocutor that St. John the Baptist was a self-declared precursor of Christ. It then came out that Guimarães, the Jewish missionary, had mistakenly believed that St. John the Baptist was one of the Old Testament figures whom he was ready to recognize as saints. In other similar stories, the improvised Jewish missionarizing emphasized biblical prophecies that had not yet been fulfilled. Religious discussions that uh, allegedly resulted in conversion also intervened in the moments of confidence and intimacy between men and women. For example, Esteban Enrique de Fonseca in Rouen was brought to Judaism there by his niece with the help of a prayer book. More frequently, the inquisitorial documents give the active role to a Jewish man who converts a Christian woman in the course of a love affair. So we have here a dimension of uh, seduction. Uh, when the Spanish inquisitors tortured Pedro Enriquez Moreno, he confessed, in the, he confessed that he had praised uh, Judaism to his lover a certain Doña Maria de Oñate, and I quote here, when he was in the house of the said Doña Maria and was lying in bed with her, among other confidential and secret things that people talk about in such indecent occasions. The love that he had for the said Doña Maria made him confident. It is not surprising, therefore, that the act of converting a woman would acquire sexual undertones. Antonia Enriquez de Mora, one of the heads of the Jewish fraction in Bordeaux had a conflict-ridden relation with his neighbor's wife, Guillaume Gomes, a staunch Catholic and a spy of the Inquisition. On one occasion, he showed her his baby son, exclaiming, exclaiming, look at this little Jew boy, to which she replied, if I ever get hold of your children, I will make them into good Christians. 
More I then answered to this, if I ever get hold of you, madam, I will make you into a good Jewess. In Andalusian dialect, however, the latest sentence had a double and quite obscene meaning. So if you re reconstruct this sentence, Senora, si yo os cogiera o si siera buena judía, uh, can also be translated as, well, if I became intimate with you, I would give you a good proof of my virility. Using the resources of obscene speech, Mora had countered the feminine Christian jargon of conversion with an expression of masculine sexual domination. And these competitions that were games of seduction at the same time between different religious positions, the converts and the agents of conversion constantly exchanged their roles. Based on this observation, it is possible to doubt the idea that there was any planned mission to the religious frontier of the Franco-Portuguese New Christians. Certain historians, Ies Reva in particular, formulated the idea that France received the visit of missionaries from Jewish communities, courageous Sephardim, who tried to conquer Jewish souls while confronting emissaries of the Inquisition who were busy spreading Christian beliefs among the same population. It is indeed possible to find trace of travel, and even among the missionarizing activity that they developed in favor of either Judaism or Catholicism, but I do not know any clear case in which these persons had actually been dispatched by their respective orthodoxies. It seems far more likely that the most active agents of conversions, uh, conversion were converts themselves, eager to accredit their sincerity. This is bluntly obvious in the case of Dr. Paulo de Lena, a Portuguese uh, physician who was condemned by the Inquisition uh, of uh, Coimbra in 1621 as a Judaizer after having denounced his entire family, and who after his emigration to Rouen, he became, as the Portuguese Jesuit father, Antonio Vieira, wrote, I quote, a column of the faith in Christ who strengthened the, web, the weak minded, lent a hand to those who were about to fall, who argued about against the stubborn headed who accused them and refuted them. For missionaries like him, proselytism was mainly an insurance policy compensating for certain doubtful aspects of their own past. This observation can be fully confirmed by the overview of some self-styled intellectuals who produced works of controversial theology in the French New Christian environment. The first among them was a Spanish New Christian, Diego de Cisneros, a native of Valderas in the province of Leon, from a divided family, while his cousin, Pedro, went to Morocco to become a Jew, he became a Carmelite monk and a lecturer in theology at the University of Douai in the Spanish Netherlands. He seems to have run into trouble in his monastery because of an affair he had with a woman. In the garb of a secular priest, the ex-Carmelite arrived around 1630 in Rouen, where, among other literary ambitions, he revealed himself a fighter of Christian orthodoxy and engaged in theological correspondence with a rabbi in Amsterdam, Saul Levi Mortera, concerning the central theological distinctions between Jewish and Christian doctrine. Mortera's polemical answers are conserved in manuscript, but we only know the title of Cisneros' rejoinder, I quote, Christian antidotes to the poison of the Jewish replies given to my written questions by the Jews of Amsterdam in September 1631, when I was in Rouen trying to convert them, tratando de su conversión. He mentioned this text in a memoir he sent in 1637 to the Spanish king, where he tries to prove that he had devoted his life to the conversion of the Jews in Flanders and in France. He points out the real urgency to counter those heretics' aggressive proselytism. It seems, he wrote to King Philip IV, that Judaism finds its greatest satisfaction and achievement in persecuting the church. The second literary controversy broke out in summer 1645 in the settlement of Perorad, already mentioned, in southern France. An unnamed John, young Portuguese from the village went to study at the University of Alcala in Spain, embraced the Christian faith there, and wrote a treatise in defense of his new religious conviction. His work provoked a refutation by the business traveler Francisco Fernandez Diaz, who edited both treatises in manuscript with verses from his friends. These two writings have unfortunately not come down to us. 
We possess, however, the fervently anti-Christian poem that Antonio Enriquez Gomez, the Spanish poet of some renown, produced in the community of Rouen, most probably in 1648, when he was living there as a merchant with his family. Enrique Gomez was of Jewish ancestry only from his father's side, and he was not easily accepted, it seems, among the clandestine circles of the Portuguese Judaists. He would betray their confidence only one year later, when he returned to Spain under a false name and became a popular playwright for the Catholic stage. The most accomplished Catholic proselytizer among the French Portuguese was Antonio da Cunha, who during his stay in Rouen in the 1650s authored a bulky manuscript work, I quote, against Jewish superstition, heresy, and apostasy, from which he published an extract in 1656 uh, under the title Explanation of the Seventy Weeks in Daniel's Ninth Chapter one of the top boy in theological controversy. We have quite a detailed knowledge of the author's biography, which is uh, uh, very interesting for his background. He was born in Seville uh, around 1615 to a new Christian merchant family. He traveled to Peru as a youngster in 1631, and uh, uh, he was uh, later on said to have tried to uh, persuade his uh, uh, travel uh, companions still on the ship of the Atlantic on many occasions to follow the law of Moses, I quote, and to practice its rites and customs because it was the good one in which he would obtain salvation. Da Cunha, however, was imprisoned by the, by, by the uh, Inquisition of Lima in 1635 when he was a merchant in, uh, in Peru and uh, until the end of the following year, more than 100 persons were arrested from a group that the inquisitorial propaganda subsequently called the Great Conspiracy, La Complicidad Grande. For some reason, the inquisitors believed that Acuna was hiding information about his fellow tradesmen. They held him in prison for almost four years and had him savagely tortured. In January 1639, Acuna was penanced in an auto da fe in Lima and exiled to Spain, from where he moved then later on to London and to Rouen to uh, stay there for a decade. In May 1661, 46 years old, he was back in Madrid, where he presented himself to the Inquisition in order to denounce the 122 crypto-Jews whom he had met on his travels. At this occasion, Acuna gave a detailed report of his life as a proud promoter of Catholicism among uh, the, uh, the French crypto-Jews. Uh, however, his only clear success was with a Rouen merchant called Antonio de Montesinos. His memory of the ways in which he con convinced him resembles the triumphant in a chess game. I quote, the witness tried to win him over to our holy Catholic faith and indeed convinced him with the help of arguments and biblical quotations making him understand that our Lord Jesus Christ was the true Messiah promised in the law. Montesinos recognized that the main question to decide was whether the Messiah said, Messiah had arrived or not, and he confessed that if the Messiah had arrived, the Catholics did well, but if not, the Jews did better. And as the witness, witness saw the harbor open in front of him, he convinced him all the more easily and disillusioned him from the error in which he had been. This initial success encouraged Acuna to write his large anti-Jewish manuscript, and uh, he decided the first, uh, to publish the first part when different persons in this city and elsewhere asked him for it. To sum up, the agents of Jewish-Christian conversion, whom we have met in this extraordinary French environment, do not show the professionalized profile of the missionaries that should emerge one generation later in the age of Protestant pietism. Proselytizing activity could be encountered in any situation and from any person. A merchant on the highway, a neighbor in the courtyard, a brother at the dining table, a lover between the sheets could inadvertently launch the religious attack. Everyone could pursue social recognition and power by becoming an agent in the conversion of others. Insistence on the compensatory function of missionary fervor should not mislead us to reconstruct the psychological and social condition of these men in a simplistic way. Their activity fulfilled a communicative function 
between various antagonistic groups. More than their adversaries, their uh, interest discourse had to pursue, persuade their own co-religionists and supposedly their own troubled religious conscience of the truth of their integral self-image. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, our next speaker is Alexander van der Haven. Alexander holds a PhD in the history of religions from the Divinity School at the University of Chicago, and he is presently a postdoctoral fellow here at the Center for the Study of Conversion and Interreligious Encounters. His work here has mostly been focused on the phenomena of Christian conversions to Judaism in the Dutch Republic and its unique political and theological context. In 2012, his book, From Lowly Metaphor to Divine Flesh, Sarah the Ashkenazi, Shabta Tzvi's Messianic Queen, and the Sabbatian Movement, was published by the University of Amsterdam and the Menashe Ben Israel Institute. Among his more recent publications, we can mention the chapter Conversion on Trial, Toleration of Apostasy, and the Trial of Three Converts to Judaism in the Dutch Republic 1614-1615, that was published this year in the volume Contesting Interreligious Conversion. Today, however, Alex will abandon his uh, uh, early modern Dutch heroes and go back to his favorite patient, Daniel Schreber, and his favorite topic of transgenderism uh, in a talk titled Spirited Woman, uh, A Spirited Woman, Woman Rather an Imbecilic Man, Conversion in the Imminent Universe. Uh, how do I turn on the... The last article, by the way, on board an extended version was just accepted by a Renaissance board. Today, so. All right, uh, I have a little, I feel I have something to explain here because exactly you all know me from, from working on uh, uh, conversion to Judaism in the Dutch Republic, and now I'm doing something completely different. However, this me conversion and my subject, Daniel Poxhaber, Venice Secular German Jets, go way back to I think 2002-03 when I took a course on religious conversion and I decided to write my paper on the conversion of Daniel Paul Schreber and I just didn't stop, I wrote a dissertation and I continued to write four more articles which I've done clandestinely while I was working at the center but they're actually all, I keep on realizing they're all about religious conversion all right <laughs> see I'm, I'm moving away from the normal stuff <laughs> In November of 1895, while incarcerated in a Zonnenstein castle, a large state mental hospital overlooking the Saxon town of Pirna and the Elbe River embracing it, the retired judge and psychiatric patient Daniel Boschreber underwent a quite unusual conversion experience. He accepted that he was becoming a woman. And I will try to interpret this here as Schreber's attempt or discovery to find salvation in a scientific, imminent, monistic cosmos. I will present the section in Schreber's memoirs in which he describes this change in full. So you can see I'm just not making this up. Um, that point in time, I still remember precisely, it coincided with a number of beautiful late autumn days during which the dense mist developed over the Elbe River every morning. This is the only poetic sentence in the whole book, by the way which therefore makes it very important. Mm -hmm. um, in this period, the signs of feminization on my body became so clear that I could no longer ignore recognizing the imminent goal toward which the whole development was directed. Even the previous nights, I had not followed the aspirations in the masculine sense of honor and put my will against it. It might have come to a real withdrawal of the penis. So close was the miracle to its completion. The soul voluptuousness had become so strong that beginning with my arms and then my legs, chest behind and then other body parts, I received the impression of having a female body. Several days of observing this suffice to, to come to a complete change in the direction of my will. So willens to do. Until then, I always considered the option that if my life was not ended by one of the merry, many threatening miracles, it would at some point become necessary to end it by killing myself. Apart from suicide, and this is very important, he uses the word selbstentleibung, which is basically like self-disembodiment, yeah? so getting rid of your body. Um, the only other possibility seemed to be some other horrible end for me. I 
of a kind unknown among human beings. But now I could see beyond doubt that the order of the world demanded my emasculation, whether I personally liked it or not. And therefore, for purely rational reasons, and Parisi just said, for purely rational reasons, nothing else remained to me than to reconcile myself with the thought of changing into a woman. Because I'm, I'm adding to the madness by moving objects. So, um, because Sigmund Freud, Carl Gustav Jung, and Jacques Lacan all have written about Schreber, the Dresdner judge has become perhaps history's most famous mental patient. His memoirs, published in 1903 by the occult publisher Oswald Mutze in Schreber's native Leipzig, has been translated in English, French, Spanish, Italian, Portuguese, Japanese, Polish, and partially in Dutch. And there's even a partially plagiarized version in Hebrew, which actually has been published as a novel. So the author stole from Schreber's memoirs and presented this as a novel written by himself. Um, in addition to the three 20th century most important psychiatrists, thinkers such as Walter Benjamin, Elias Canetti, Gilles Deleuze and Felix Guattari, and Michel de Certeau, and this is only a few, have written about him, usually to make a critical point about modernity. Moreover, many works of art have been inspired on him, such as to take two random examples. On the left you have, uh, 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 there's a series of paintings by the painter Martin Kippenberger, and on the right, uh, this is a picture of a play, made, maybe some of you have seen it, it uh, won a prize in, uh, in the first prize in the Akko uh, Theatre Festival by Ram de Goor. Which is very bloody, cruel, lots of blood, cruelness. And I, I was in his advice, and I disagreed with everything he did. Uh, but he went on anyway, and he got the first prize. And if he didn't listen to me, he wouldn't have gotten the first prize. So that's good. Um, he went really for the transgression. Um, aside from those who read Schreiber's, Schreiber's memoir shallowly and only use him to make the profound point they already wanted to make anyway, and this happens actually quite a bit, the book touches in many a raw nerve that is not just related to the deep suffering that accompanies mental illnesses, but also it has something to do with modernity. People feel there's something really uh, pertinent to what's happening to us now. Okay, if we return for a moment to the conversion passage, we see that Seamus' conversion is embedded in two central themes, namely his gender transformation and death. The form Seamus' conversion took wasn't joining a new religious community, or his was a religion of one. Neither did his conversion coincide with the moment he decided to commit to a body of beliefs. Even though, if he write, because he writes elsewhere in his memoirs, religious revelations had taught me the better than to maintain the agnostic scientific worldview I had held prior to my illness, his religious conversion, his change of will, as he calls it, takes place long after acquiring that knowledge namely when he ceases his resistance to become a woman. The second central element in Schreiber's conversion, death, namely the situation from which the first, the gender transformation, is an escape, seems to go beyond the fact that suicidal tendencies, like in the Schreiber case, frequently accompany mental illnesses. I just got back from a, a conference in New York specifically about Schreiber. These conferences exist, they're always very strange. And I learned that 41% that of American tran transgender men and women attempt suicide at least once in their lives. And if you really put it, it once suffices. Whereas 4.5% of the American population does so. This is a very high suicide rate. Um, moreover, one of the speakers, a Lacanian psychoanalyst from Philadelphia, shared her observation that her transgender analysis, and I know how many, but she was talking about my transgender analysis, if you had like 20 or 40, um, shared an obsession with death. Although the conference's audience, and this also reflects, I've been doing a bit of online research, uh, this also reflects the most research interpreted this in a political sense, namely as rooted in the social stigma about transgenderism, and there's really a correlation if you're more persecuted, then the chance that you kill yourself is more likely. I got a sense from the example she gave that there's a deeper connection between death and transgenderism than suffering caused by, caused by social rejection. While Schreiber's masculine pride, and I'm showing you all kinds of pieces of art based, based on his, his uh, book, while Schreiber's masculine pride did contribute to this agony, his conversion narrative also states that becoming a woman was the only alternative to an otherwise inevitable death. 
While it's still possible to read this death rag as rooted in the same social stigma, I think the two can and should be separated. Schreber's claim uncannily resembles the words of one of the Lacanian psychoanalysts and analysts, who said, it's either death or changing my gender. In both these cases, the gender transformation seems to replace death as the only possible salvation. And this, of course, is an invitation that all the Christian uh, uh, people try to cure transgenderism because if you are transgender, you kill yourself, would completely oppose. Um, the only, so death is the only way out of something, and we're going to find out like what this exactly is. I will do so by placing Schreiber's gender transformation slash religious conversion in a specific cultural context, even though transgenderism is not restricted to modern Western culture alone, and it's possible that this relation between death and changing of gender is a universal phenomenon. To acquire this context, we will commence our journey in Scotland, and I already heard William James mention here, so that is good. There, in Aberdeen and Edinburgh, exactly at the same time that Schreiber was writing his memoirs, somebody else was addressing very similar problems. Um, and this is the great American philosopher and psychologist William James, who explained to his audience the difference between, on the one hand, sick and morbid souls, and on the other hand, the optimist or the healthy-minded souls. James identified the first, less cheery category with the monist worldview, a view on which also Schreiber's religious cosmology and, uh, is based. Monism is a term uh, coined by Christian Wolf in 1721 and now rarely used. Most of you have never heard of the term, which originated in the philosophies of Gianna Bruno, Giordano Bruno and Bruce Spinoza. It emerged as a philosophical force in a romantic reaction to Kantian transcendentalism and in the philosophy of Kant's German idealist successes in the 19th century. And you can also find it as its most significant expression today in scientific materialism. Monism opposes the common traditional view that emerged victorious in Western Christianity and which is also reflected in Descartes and Kant's philosophies, although Kant also kind of puts in a time bomb in which uh, this also leads to a self-destructing uh, philosophy. A view that sees reality as divided in on the one hand spiritual mental and on the other hand physical element. So this is a transcendental view. Um, in contrast, monists believe in the individual nature of reality. This had led some monists, especially in the first half of the 19th century, to argue that everything is in, in, as in essence spiritual. While others, and Schreiber and most of his German contemporaries belong to this category, argue that all, materi all is material, ranging from very fine to very crude matter. A third group of monists, of whom James would become its most influential voice, were the neutral monists who advocating to altogether abandoned thinking in these categories. By the way, on the left we have Daniel Paul Schreiber, uh, when he's released again from the hospital, his beautiful moustache that he had shaved off in order to become a woman has returned, and on the right we have William James. Modernism found its way in a great, great variety of contemporary religious beliefs and practices, such as the theories of very fine psychic method. You can think of magnetism, for instance, or the von Reichenbach's uh, theory of all that you can see here in an in, 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 uh, uh, illustration from his book. And the spiritualist idea that mediums were similar to finely tuned measuring machines. So, for instance, Reichenbach said, like, this is what very fine tuned people can see whereas we cannot, and we can also develop photographic machines that can also do this. So that's an invisible reality which is actually material. Also the revelation that Schreber received unequivocally showed him that God and the human soul are both made of the same very fine substance which connects the different parts of the universe to each other. James believed that the monists were morally and uh, philosophically superior to non-monists. But he did not regard this fact to their personal advantage. For the happier category of the non monists James wrote, quote, the world is an aggregate or collection of higher and lower things and principles. As a consequence, they could ignore the existence of evil in the world by banning it to a different, uh, distant uh, compartment of reality. And you could, for instance, compare this to um, uh, political dualism in which you say, like, we're the good guys and they're the bad guys, so whenever we commit something, bad, it cannot be us because it should belong to the other side. Yeah, so a monist cannot make this distinction, according to James. 
For monists, in contrast, because they regard the world as, quote, one flawless unit of fact, so James argued, evil is an inseparable part of existence, and as a result, they cannot bear reality. Akin to Schreber and transgender people, existence is to them a cancerous disease in need of a dramatic cure. Yet, there are other movements, such as a number of social reform movements and the so-called mind cure movement, that combine monism with a profoundly optimistic worldview. Rather than inconsistent and illogical, as James dismissed these, they demonstrate that monism does not automatically imply a darker view of reality. So I'm not making the point monism automatically leads to. However, most modern Western monisms have been of a pessimistic nature, and this is also reflected in criticisms of modernism. So we'll get back to this gender change, and then you can uh, revive. Um, we have already seen that James identified monism with the melancholy of not being able to deny that evil is ingrained in, our very, in the very core of our existence. To Schreber, the fact that God was material and therefore vulnerable to natural forces meant the destruction of what he believed an invisible moral order. Schreber's concern, or concern echoed that of others, mostly Christian critics, who held that our moral order is constructed on the ontological separation of mind and matter, soul and body, and God and the world. For instance, Christian Ernst Luther, who was the church preacher of the Leipzig University Church where uh, Schreber received his legal education, regarded monism as paramount to denying religion because, so he argued, it implied that there is no possibility of a relationship with a transcendental God, and therefore no free will, no life after death with the possibility for moral justice uh, after death, and no morality. Also for Schreber's father, the well-known pedagogue Moritz Schreber, the moral and mental well-being of every human being was contingent on the absolute separation of the body and the mind. In the years before his illness, Schreber read a number of popular scientific works that, as he reports in his famous footnote 36, from Schreber and so others have been talk about footnote 36, uh, deeply influenced him. The religious cosmos that his madness unveiled to him was therefore not surprisingly a monistic cosmos, where God and humans, the dead and the living, are all made from the same stuff, incarcerated in the same realm of existence with frightening consequences. I have already pointed out that God's vulnerability and thus impotence to justly merit punishment or rewards. And another example is the memoir's seventh appendix, which Schreiber advises burial rather than cremation, because crematoria's high temperature can destroy the soul. Which is, there's something really uncanny about this, because Sonnenstein, the, the, the mental hospital where he lived, 30 years later, 40 years later, became a final destination for the mentally ill, and the villagers down, down in the town complained about ashes raining down on them. So there's something very awfully <coughs> prophetic about what he writes here. In other words, a divine and therefore benevolent transcendental order has made place for monist chaos. Yet, along this hellish monist existence came Schreber's gender transformation, a transformation that offered life versus death. So let's take a brief look at it. It is telling that Schreber's first flirtation with becoming a woman was positive. In the beginning of June 1893, the talented jurist in his early 50s was appointed as president of the appeals court in Dresden the second highest legal position in Saxony. During the four months between his appointment and assuming his responsibilities in the fall, he dreamt repeatedly that an earlier bout of mental illness had returned. Yet, he also had a halfway experience of imagining that, quote, it would really be beautiful to be a woman succumbing to sex. After Schreber had begun his new position on October 1, 1893, the <coughs> superior of two most older colleagues unaware of their presence President's fantasies, he soon became overburdened by the responsibilities of his work. He began to suffer from insomnia and hallucinations, with his result that on November 21 he entered Leipzig University's psychiatric clinic. And so the judge embarked on the psychiatric nightmare because he was, this was a private clinic, but his competency was taken away from him, so within half a year he became an a, a involuntary patient. Uh, and this nightmare would last until 1902. There, the institutionalized judge began to experience the monist short-circuiting of a transcendental system. 
He believed that external influences operated on his nervous system from a distance. These were bodily effects. Uh, these were voices of dead souls, deafening as nerves, as well as subtle miracles. The latter were bodily effects such as heating up his body or cooling it down, miracles that tried to drive, tried to drive him mad, and following his summary premonition, unpending miracles that sought to reverse the development of his male sexual organs and to develop female sexual, sexual body parts. This unmanning miracle, so Schreber believed initially, originated in a plot against him that aimed to deliver his soul to another human being while his female body would be left to that human being for sexual abuse, after which it would be both simply disposed of, so it would be left to die. Preferring an honorable death to an ignoble fate, Schreber sought to end his life by drowning himself, of course he tried to do it in the bathtub, it didn't work, uh, he tried to starve himself, it didn't work out, demanded cyanide and strychnine from the guards who ignored him, and he also demanded that they should bury him alive, which also did not work. Whereas Schreber's initial transsexual fantasy had been positive, here it becomes an, a symptom of the inevitable evil of a monist cosmos, while death is the escape from it. Schreber believed that hostile forces tried to capture a soul, that every human essence that Martha always claimed it could not be taken from them by execution now as a material substance could come into the possession of others. In addition, these forces aim to violate his body by changing its God-given gender to sexual abuse, after which he would be left to die. Yet, Schreber's attitude to his gender transformation took again a positive turn. He came to see it as a necessity, despite the negative consequences for his honor, for the survival of humanity. What happened? Instead of gaining the noble death his honor demanded, Schreber became the recipient of powerful visions of worldwide and even galactic, galactic destruction. Schreber will characterize these visions as, quote, in part of a gruesome nature, but in part also of indescribable magnificence. And Elias Kenneth kind of said, this is, he kind of wants this destruction. He saw that there's something very sick about this, almost desire. Um, the Schreiber really saw the planet, as well as extraterrestrial population, being wiped out by social Darwinian wars, epidemics, and other catastrophes, until he was the last one standing. From voices he heard that he was the wandering Jew, the Ewiger Jude, the superior person who in each historical world destruction is spared to repopulate the world within new human race. Reminded me of this. So he's kind of like the transgendered Noah, or maybe even like the Blake, like the War of Babylon. Like he's the, he has to be the last person who has to become a woman in order to repopulate the world. Although the desire for restoring a transcendental order on a God's sovereignty after a Noahite flood-like destruction, orchestrated by God, is clearly part of it, Saber's acceptance of his gender transformation is much more than that. It is also monist salvation. After Schreber's conversion, those races that aimed at discarding Schreber, which I read here as the voice calling Schreber to death, did not make, quote, a hypocritical appeal to my sense of manly honor. So they asked him, are you not ashamed, ashamed before your wife? Or what kind of appeal, appeals for president would him, let himself be effed? Schreber, however, did not let himself be fooled. Since then, he said, I have embraced in full consciousness the cultivation of femininity as a principle. Others for whom the supersensory grounds of this process are hidden can think of me what they want. I would like to see that man, this is the best sentence of the whole book, when put to the choice of being an imbecile with a male habitus or a spirited woman, spirited woman would not choose the latter. This change in the direction of will was followed by a further development in Schreiber's beliefs. He ceased to regard his gender transformation as serving the birth of a new Roman race after a divine judgment, and instead became convinced that it was necessary in order to attract or seduce a god frightened for his destruction. This really reminds me of Kabbalah. A god frightened for his destruction by human hands back to the vicinity of his creation in order to re-enable salvation that Sheber believed had been suspended. To do so, Sheber maintained he had to become a woman irresistible even to a frightened god. The fact that for Schreiber to embrace his female faith was his personal salvation and the world's redemption. And the way he did so leads us, I suggest, to what is or can be salvation in a monist universe. 
What did Schreber do? After his conversion, he sat every day for hours in one of the hospital garden chairs, and this is the, you can see the hospital garden here, immobile like a corpse, so that divine rays would not be deterred by him, and expose his body to the sun, he identified the sun with God, while generating a feeling of bliss, so that the flow of unmanning divine rays would be continuous. This absolute passivity, as he called it, he regarded it as his religious duty. With his imagination, he created for himself and for the race the, quote, impression that my body was equipped with female breasts and genitals. He got so used to this mental effort that whenever he bent over, he mentally drew a female behind. So he was continuously working on it. Um, this drawing, as he called it, was a reverse miracle, which meant that not only the race would compress images on his nervous system, but they, that he could also show them to them images that they want to impress on them. Also, Zonenstein's psychiatrist noticed Schreber's pathologically changed worldview, which expressed itself, among others, in shaving off his moustache and adopting feminine dress and behavior. What is so important about these magical ritualistic actions, including traditional and esoteric techniques using the imagination, is that Schreber reconciled with what no known is, such as Luthard and Schreber's seniors are greatly feared. Namely, that a just order, William James called their comfortable, comfortable compartmentalization of reality, did not exist in and of itself. Rather than regarding this as a catastrophe and resisting it, as he had initially had done, Schreber restored human agency to act upon the superhuman real from the powerlessness that the development of Christian, in particular Protestant theology, had reduced it to. There is therefore no reason to bewail the collapse of God's power to secure a moral order. The memoirs seem to suggest, instead, the spirit of Rumi Schreiber showed that we can embrace our own magical powers to make, rather than restore, order in the world. From his psychiatrist report, we even learned that Schreiber at times, a fact omitted in the memoirs, that Schreiber identified with himself with God. In a modest universe, humans can become God. Can I just conclude this? Almost done. I conclude. I've been making a fool. In the past, I was smart and I said it in the middle of the paper. I'm, I'm more honest. I conclude with making a full circle by coming back to, to that and Schreber's gender transformation by way of William James. James saw, as the answer to the monist soul, suffering, uh, James saw as the answer to the monist soul, suffering, religious conversion. Religious conversion heals the soul by embracing in thought and through experience the unseen world, as he called it, as a benevolent order. In a sense, its conversion denies or overrules monist reality by imprinting on one's mind what Freud called an illusion, but which James, the pragmatist philosopher, regarded as a real, as real because of his real effect. Yeah, so the monist self is suffering by definition because he cannot deny it, or she cannot deny it. evil. James, in the, in the sense of where you have to kind of fool yourself by imagining this benevolent other, uh, other world. Schreber, however, faced a far greater challenge. His notion, uh, James's notion only works if the healing infusion from the unseen world is not part of one's present monist experience. Schreber, however, did cross that boundary and gained access to this unseen world. And this experience from the other side was not benevolent in any sense. So he had no way out, like James had. So how, as one of James's six souls, could Schreber's absolute dependence on religious conversion for personal redemption be fulfilled since he had seen more of the four others invisible world than was good for him? The first salvation, the only way out of a monist prison, was death. Existence is suffering, and one cannot ignore this. So you can end your private existence, existence by self enlightenment by disembodiment. Through an act of will, abandoning this body and the reality that it is part. Yet, announcing itself at the onset of Schreber's illness, there was another form of redemption. One that was also deeply related to death, but which is added, which is added to it, rebirth. This was to die as a man and to be reborn as a woman. And Schreber did it like he said, like, my body is like regressing to kind of an embryonic stage and then like developing again female traits. It literally is self enlivened, so disembodying oneself, followed by, and I tried to come up with a better, good German word, Wiederleibung. Sounds good? 
<laughs> I think maybe Vida Kirkhorn or something. But like so he also like makes his body again by rebody. This form of salvation does not need what monism regards as impossible, namely the traditional intrusion of the redemptive and just transcendental real in the disworldly real. The promise of a future place in the transcendental real or a change as if imitating these. Instead, it uses the transforming power of monist existence itself. Thank you. Right, it's with much delight that I introduce the third speaker. May I? May I no. Um, of this panel, who is a dear teacher of mine and a source of great inspiration, Claude Dostoevsky. Claude is an associate professor at the Department of General History at Barland University, and of course a board member uh, of the study for the center uh, of the Center for the Study of Conversion here at Mendrian University. His main fields of interest are the conversal phenomena in early modern encounters between European and non-European. Uh, which he often explores through the intersections between uh, theological and political traditions, ideas, and realities. His studies brings together diligent readings of the sources and the passionate engagement with broader historiographical issues and perspectives. In recent years, Claude has been re reclaiming the political aspects of the conversal phenomena as an essential component not only to the development uh, of theological notions and structures as Paulinism, but also for the shaping of conversal personal identity. He has published by now more than 20 articles on these subjects, and if to mention just two of my personal favorites, from polemics to apologetics to the, from polemics and apologetics to theology and politics, Alonso de Cartagena and the Conversos within the Mystical Body, that appeared in 2014 in the volume in honor of Aura. And Harmonizing identities, the problem, uh, the problem, the problem of the integration of the Portuguese conversos in early modern Iberian corporate polities, in, uh, appeared in 2011 in Jewish history. The title of his talk today is "Conversal Merchants as Secret Agents of Portugal's Imperial Catholicism." So, without further ado, a lecture given in 1539 at the University of Salamanca, known as on the American Indians, the renowned teacher of theology and canon law, Friar Francisco de Vitoria, answered a burning question. By what, by what right were the Indians subjected to Spanish rule? Following the scholastic tradition, he offered two justifications to Columbus' initial discoveries, mission and commerce. On the one hand, spreading the gospel among the barbarians in the new world, meant to fulfill Christ's commandment, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Matthew 28, 19. By the middle of the 13th century, this evangelical predicament became monopolized by the Pope as the ultimate spiritual father of mankind, whereas in the 15th century, Roman pontiffs commissioned Portuguese and Spanish monarchs the task of enabling mission in distant lands for these required expensive resources and logistics. Since salvation could only be achieved through Christianity, extra ecclesia nulla salus, converting heathens in the name of the Pope was an act of unavoidable altruism. Following Vittoria, it also appeared that the right of free preaching, jus praedicandi, was legitimate from the non-denominational standpoint of the law of nations, the Roman jus gentium, for it did not contravene the universal pristine norms of friendly, friendly communication. On the other hand, the Stoic-oriented use gentium perceived commerce as the embodiment of that natural partnership leading Vitoria to infer that Spanish travelers and merchants should be welcomed by the Amerindians. Vitoria knew 
that mission could be an excuse to whitewash brutal conquest and exploitation. One of his followers, Melchor Cano, warns against a naive interpretation of Vittoria Ius Peregrinandi by ironically reminding that, I quote, we would not be prepared to describe Alexander the Great as a traveler. Readers of Victoria do not agree whether on the American Indians is a sheer admonition against imperialism or an astute juridical legitimation. For our concerns, however, it reveals a common function given to mission and commerce as peaceful ways to advance human fraternity. Particularly in the Portuguese case, an interwoven relationship between mission and commerce occurred out from the beginning. Popes concede to the Portuguese exclusive rights of travel and commerce as means to support evangelization. Merchandising was the most attractive imperial drive, especially through the lucrative spice trade in India. Whereas Spanish American Brazil were lands of colonization, the Portuguese Eastern gigantic imperial space called Estado da India, from today's Mozambique to Japan, was a talasocracy, an empire at sea, with only few scattered controlled outposts and settlements such as Goa, Cochin, Macau. In his Historiarium Indicar in 1588, the Jesuit Giovanni Pietro Maffei reminded that mission in Japan became possible through the economic peaceful activities of the merchant and not of the bellicose conquistadors like in Spanish America. Along with the itinerant missionary, the merchant travel appears as particular adapt to Portugal's eastern thalassocracy. That is why in 1625, the polymath Manuel Severin de Faria still championed a Portuguese control over the Indian seas through a policy of mare clausum against Hugo Grotius free trade argumentation in his mare liberum, refusing simplistic interpretation of commerce as merely stemming from use gentium, Severin de Faria claimed that without protectionism, the Portuguese will any more fulfill the missionary role conferred by the popes on behalf of the non-missionary economic opportunism of the heretic Dutch. In other words, without safeguarded commerce will neither be possible to accomplish any more successful conversions. During the reign of King Manuel I from 1495 to 1521, Commerce was not merely seen as a means to achieve mission, it was also a sign of it. In what Luis Felipe Tomas called a Manueline a imperial idea replete with the similar millenarian Joachimite Overton of Columbus and Divorce, Portugal's rapid geographical expansion, economic riches, and successful mass conversions were perceived as a moment of plenitude announcing the eschaton. According to several 16th century chronicles, having baptized his Jews in 1497 out of piety, King Manuel was rewarded by God with the arrival of Vasco da Gama to Calicut in 1498 and with the discovery of Brazil in 1500. And surprisingly enough, King Manuel added to his many royal titles, that of Lord of Navigation, Conquest, and Commerce, and introduced into Portugal's heraldry, and you have here an armillary sphere with Psalm 37.3, trust in the Lord and to God shall, shall do what dwell in the land, and thou shalt be fed by his riches. Whereas in Vitoria, Spain, a uh, homology was ascertained between commerce and mission. In King Manuel's Portugal, both interacted as a Baudelarian symbolic correspondence. The Manueline imperial idea, however, was quickly dismissed. 
On the one hand, by locating military prowess in a second range after commerce, it defied the chivalrous dominant ethos promoted by the nobility, who insisted on the perpetuation of the Iberian Reconquista crusading struggle beyond the seas as the best companion to mission. In his Decades of Asia, 1552, the humanist historian João de Barros was disturbed by King Manuel's title, Lord of Commerce. Increasing wealth through commerce, he said, is a risky means to obtain glory because one is easily driven downwards by its material penchant. On the other hand, many of King Manuel's baptized Jews called New Christians prospered in international business as the point of dominating the Indian spice trade. During the 16th and the 17th century, men of commerce became synonymous to new Christians. In an early book called Ropika Pnefma, of, or Spiritual Merchandise, 1532, the Barros equated the materialist mind of Portugal ascending bourgeois merchant class with a new Christian proclivity to Judaize. In order to neutralize the noxious influence of Jewishness on the general population, he wrote that book as a way to argue that spiritual merchandise is in fact an oxymoron. The quest after terrestrial gains and human souls were destined to collide. I will argue that the Barros claims were indication of King Manuel's failure to transform his kingdom into a mercantile society led by a noble or Christian elite mixed with converso entrepreneurs who will ensure Portugal's evangelical imperial role. As part of what John Eliot identified years ago, as a phenomenon of self-perception of an Iberian crisis in the 17th century, and as a way to put to an end to new Christian socio-religious exclusion, converso and pro-converso element called to revive the Manueline imperial idea by depicting Portugal's new Christians as secret imperial agents of conversion. By secret, I mean mysterious and hidden. The former meaning was elaborated by the new Christian spice merchant, Duarte Nunes Solis, especially in his discourses, discourses on the commerce of the two Indies, 1622. On the one hand, Gomez Solis interpreted the astrolabe as a providential invention given by God to King Manuel through his Jewish and converse astronomers as part of God's plan to transform Portugal into an evangelizing maritime empire. On the other hand, in remote parts of the Estado da India, converse merchants, he said, were depicted as informal missionaries, preaching and giving their own example to the heathens while doing business. In, a, in the new, newly discovered Brazil, he added, the new Christian Noronias were the first to recognize the potential riches of Brazil wood and sugar under the inspiration of divine providence. In this way, Brazil's Indian became familiar with the gospel well before the arrival of the trained Jesuits. In other words, for Gomez Solis, the new Christian were simultaneously vital nerves of empires as gifted merchants and divine vessels through which the Portuguese will complete St. Paul's conversion project in Romans 11 as signs of God's chosen people. Much like Gomez Solis, the Jesuit father Antonio Vieira ascribed to converso merchants a similar secret missionary role. In his 1646 proposal to King John IV to reform the Inquisition, Father Vieira elaborated on the idea that even the heretical among the new Christians were unconscious agents of conversion. 
the lucrative economic activities of the crypto-Jewish merchants, he said, enabled the Portuguese to sponsor mission among the heathens. In Vieira words, I quote, this is to vanquish infidelity by its own weapons, like the conquest of the promised, promised land with the treasures of the Egyptians, end of quote. Such hiddenness stemmed from the soteriological Judeo-Gentile diachronic rhythm announced by Romans 11 and propelled by King Manuel. I quote again, the reason why God sent to the world the kingdom of Portugal was not the faith of the Jews, but the conversion of the Gentiles, he said. However, by supporting the conversion of the heathens, these heretic conversion merchants paved the way to their own salvation, according to St. Paul's prophetic mystery there. That blindness, in part, is happening to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so Israel shall be saved, as it is written, there shall come out Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. The revival of the Manueline imperial idea by converso and pro-converso element entailed an upgrading of the symbolic correspondence between commerce and mission into a synergetic phenomenon of elective affinity. I employ this term of alchemical and romantic origin for it was used by Max Weber to denote a phenomenon of mutual attraction and combination between Calvinist forms of religious beliefs and the capitalist economic ethos in his The Protestant Ethics and the Spirit of Capitalism, 1905. That said, to ensure Weber's Valverwandschaft into the early modern Iberia conversal context not only implied a full integration of the new Christian into the Portuguese society and the recognition of their fundamental contribution to the imperial evangelical project. It also required a radically different way of envisioning the Jewish roots of Christianity and a new idea of materiality as channeling spirituality. It was one thing to acknowledge homology between commerce and mission from a stoic Christian perspective, like in Victoria. Another thing was to adopt, in the long run, the Joachimite symbolic correspondences of commerce and mission, according to an enthusiastic Manueline imperial idea. But to widely accept the proconverso elective affinity between converso merchants and Catholic mission necessitated a theological, political, Copernican revolution. For this reason, to acknowledge the converso merchants as agents of Portugal imperial Catholicism couldn't become hegemonic in 17th century Iberia, even in times of deep crisis, waiting to the crystallization of a positive Judeo-Christian paradigmatic shift after the Holocaust, it was the turn of the young Karl Marx to complain that the war was gone Jewish through the dissemination of a capitalistic ethos and of Werner Zombaut lamenting that the purported Protestant capitalist elective affinity of Weber was in fact a damning Faustian pact of a world converted into the Jewish commercial values. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Our final speaker, uh, Miriam Elia Feldon, a professor emerita of early modern European history at Tel Aviv University, and at present the chairperson of the Historical Society of Israel. In the years 2003 and 2015, she was editor-in-chief of the historical Portuguese Manim, and for generations of Israeli students and historians, myself included, she has been the alluring face of early modern studies, writing and teaching 
about topics as the invention of identities during the age of discovery, utopian thought, toleration, pacifism, and peace plans, the origins of racism in the West, religious conversions during the Reformation era, and attitudes toward gypsies. In 2012, her book, Renaissance Impostors and Proofs of Identity, was published by Palgrave. She also co-edited the volumes, The Origins of Racism in the West by Cambridge University Press 2009, and together with Tamar Herzig, The, De the Dissimulation and Deceit in Early Modern Europe, published by Palgrave 2015. And today she will be our last respondent. for this very kind introduction and I'm very happy to be here um, and I sort of I sympathize with Professor Sviri about the problem of <laughs> responding to, to three very three very different or at least some of the very different uh, papers and I'll try to do my best. When I first started working on Renaissance imposters one of my senior colleagues uh, issued a warning. He said, stay away from the question of identity. Uh, and I'm glad I did, because uh, as I soon discovered, and all these papers, and all, all the papers in, these, in this session demonstrate, um, the question of identity is a very, question of identity of the self is a very elusive entity. It's a very elusive problem. Um, if we agree, that the early modern period was the age of conversion uh, in capital letters uh, in Europe as well as in European colonies and spheres of influence on other continents. And as a result of being the age of conversion, it is also the time when religious dissimulation proliferated, then the problem of defining an, an identity becomes all the more acute. Hence, we find expressions such as divided souls, as Elisha uh, Kalibach called her book, or souls in dispute, David Graceboard's uh, title. Um, and what was the identity of Samuel Palacci, the man of the of three worlds, whom uh, Mercedes Garcia Anale and Sarah Alpigas presented to us? And all that of Leo Africanus, as portrayed by Natalie Davis. Ambivalent personalities is the term used here that was used here by Carsten Wilke. Um, and I have no doubt that Daniel Paul Scherber uh, identity, uh, although his conversion is of a very different kind, uh, remained elusive to his doctors who treated him and perhaps to Alexander van der Haven as well. Um, I must say that uh, the one thought that occurred to me while listening to the to Judith uh, Weiss uh, talk about Bustel and uh, Alexander van der Haven talking about Schreber was what would have happened if we put them together in the same mental <laughs> asylum. <laughs> it's, uh, they, I'm sure they would have a lot to talk about. Um, this is the, the fact that it, it was that the early modern period was an age of dissimulation is perhaps old news. But now we learn that not only the converts, but also the agents of conversion as well, could be ambivalent personalities. Merchants of the Portuguese na nation, a significant group in the 17th century, with its peculiar characteristics, I, I avoid the term identity, of being of converts or extraction, whether loyal Catholics, secret Judaizers, or living openly as Jews, they were Iberian in their culture, and devoted to commerce. That's their collective portrait. At least some of them, as, uh, as Wilkins and Stuczynski tell us, were considered to be on a mission to convert their fellow men, either to Christianity or to Judaism. Yet they, be, they were not by any means professional missionaries. And now let me, in parenthesis, ask a question which occurred to me when I was listening to the talks about the Sufis, am I right in thinking that only the Catholic Church had professional missionaries? Uh, pro proselytizing was of course carried out by all, but were there in non-Christian religions groups similar to the monastic orders whose members devoted 
their entire lives to converting the Hindus. But for that matter, was there a similar, in other religions, a similar uh, institution to the Catholic Inquisition? So that's some other question. It seems very reasonable to assume, as Wilke does, that proselytizing was a form of insurance policy uh, for, for new Christians to persuade their community, whether Jewish or Catholic, of the sincerity of their faith. If that was the case, then it, it, then it is but further evidence to the atmosphere of distrust and weariness. More than the fear of heresy, Europeans in the 16th and 17th centuries were afraid that things were not what they seemed and people were not who they claimed to be. Suspicion was evoked not only by new Christians, but by all converts. And at every step they took, both at their initial conversion and then when they wished to return to their former community. We see a similar pattern when looking at the phenomenon of returning renegades. renegades. That is, Christians who converted to Islam, or turned Turk, as was the term at the time, and later wished to return to their former church and community. This was probably a larger phenomenon, numerically speaking, than that of conversos returning to Judaism, by, by far. Uh, their religious loyalty was often suspected by the Muslims when they converted to Islam, and it was always considered doubtful when they came back from the Muslim world, uh, whether to Italy, Spain, or England, claiming they had remained faithful to Jesus in their hearts. This is a whole chapter of religious dissimulation which is still in need of further investigation. Claude Dov Stuczynski presents us with the conflicting visions which inspired Portuguese empire building overseas. The one which saw Portuguese achievements as part of, the God, of God's this grand design to evangelize all nations. The other which was far more secular and materialistic, seeing the discoveries as the means to enrichment and aggrandizement of Portugal. <laughs> Since many of the Portuguese merchants were new Christians, then if one wished to adhere to the missionary vision, one needed to ascribe to these merchants a Christian vocation. Therefore, in Antonio Vieira's outlook, the new Christians merchants were willy-nilly agents of conversion. We thus encountered two new types on convertos at work on the imaginary stage of missionary activities in the early modern period, both connected to the Portuguese Nassau Hebrea. The one was the one type was of those agents on conversion among the Jews and new Christians in southern France who proselytized or boasted of success in converting others as a way of proving their religious fidelity. Again, either to the to Judaism to which they have reverted or to the Catholic Church. And the other type, on the other hand, the new Christian merchants who brought the light of Christianity to, <coughs> to the natives of other continents. Should these actors be named clandestine converters? I doubt it. Um, when I was asked to, to participate here, one of the organizers of this conference said, when we see the word clandestine or deceit, we think of you. Um, so, <laughs> uh, which is an improvement, because when I was a student, I translated the book by uh, Jane Goodall on the chimpanzees. And then at the time, people said, ah, I went to the zoo last week and I thought of you. Uh, so, <laughs> now I'm associated with deceit and imposter. Better. Uh, the, the, the people that we heard about here uh, did not act in secrecy. If they had acted, if they had acted at all. Um, um, and why did I say it was an imaginary stage? Because it was mostly created either in the imagination of inquisitors who were obsessed with the idea that you that new uh, Christians were under, uh, undermining the purity of the Catholic community, or by men, rarely by women, by men who made up stories about their success as converters, or by, as, again, as Klaus Stuczynski said, or by pro-conversos, the idealists such as Vieira, who wanted to believe that the merchants were fulfilling its Christian mission. 
They may not have been clandestine converters. On the contrary, perhaps, if new Christians participated in any conversion campaign, they surely wish to get credit for it. Mm -hmm. However, this era of forced conversion and of religious dissimulation undoubtedly gave birth to a deep fear of secrecy, deceit, and clandestine activities. And, and no one at this time was immune from being suspected of duplicity and fraud. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, we have quite the time for a discussion, so I'll just open the floor for questions. Johnny? Yeah. I just have a comment. Uh, some parts of Jewish theology, in light of the idea of Jewish essentialist difference between Jews and non-Jews, there is attempts to explain how one could convert to Judaism, and the answer was, was often given that a, that a Jewish soul was basically captured in the non-Jewish body, and all you're doing by conversion is repairing the body to match the soul. And it seems to me that's very much the argument used by chan, transgender today, that it's a man born in a woman's body, or a woman born in a man's body, and all they're doing is repairing it. So it's just a comment. It seems the, this parallelism between conversion and transgender is not only in, in, in your case. Yeah, of course, in, in the whole transgender discussion is very complicated, because at the same time you have this argument that identity is not something fixed. Yeah. So you have a really strange conflict between, on the one hand, this argument, I'm truly a woman and I'm in the wrong body, and at the same time, uh, this ideological discourse almost that I choose my identity. So it, it, it's, it's a very, I, I try to, I talk to many people about this, and I still haven't figured out how this works. There's this whole transgender community is talking about these issues. Can, for instance, also say I don't have a gender. That's another identity you have. Mm -hmm. Right. I think in the Jewish discussion, it's that it's an actual Jewish soul, yeah. which is caught in the wrong body. And just yeah. Which also sometimes is, is accompanied with this, this, this traditional belief in reincarnation. So literally, a Jewish soul reincarnates in the Gentile body. Just a second, John Paul. Yes. I have a question for Claude and his Portuguese. Merchants. Um, the, the first question is that it's got two parts. The, the first one is got to do with the role of uh, missionaries in the Jesuit order who were of new Christian origins. And obviously they had a very active role in socialism, but they were increasingly margin marginalized. So the paradox is, well, the paradox, or maybe the parallel story to what happened to the short trade in the empire is the way um, those who were doing exactly what what this scheme would su suggest they should be doing are actually increasingly put on the, not allowed to do it. And, and the second part is the question about the, the debate about the claim, the claim. I mean, in, 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 uh, as, as things get more and more difficult for the Portuguese Empire in the late 16th and the 17th century, what you find is all these people agonizing about how they're losing the military spirit. And then people like Duarte Gomez Solis saying the opposite. We have to do more like the Dutch than the English. So in effect, it becomes a split. Yes. They don't have a consensus. They, uh, yes. they, they, they can't. So the, 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 the aristocratic spirit um, um, is pulling in one direction and the American have in the other, and the whole thing pulls apart. So do you see that as something, to, as a cultural failure, or just simply as an imperial failure? This is because they cannot have the right solutions institutionally and economically, then there is no cultural synthesis. May I? Okay. Uh, of course, I, very, very quickly, uh, the Jesuits in Portugal were the first, among the first, to ask the instauration of a law of purity of blood. And just finally, the laws were imposed on the company by the end of the 16th century, and then, and then in a more systematic way in the 17th century. But of course, there were cases of, of conversos. But 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 these conversos, which was, let's say, the Jesuits or or the Franciscans, they were Jesuits or Franciscans. 
the, the, the merchants, on the contrary, in Portugal, were identified as conversos. And that is why they could not make a differentiation between their economic role and the ethnic origin. And, and this is, even if it, if it is, was a stereotype, of course, if, of course, among those international merchants there were a lot of old Christian mixed, etc. But, but the stereotype was that they had to have some to do with, 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 with Jewish, uh, uh, Jewish origin. And this is one of the specificities, I think, of the, sorry for being Marxist uh, just now, of the struggle of classes in the Iberian Peninsula and more particularly in Portugal, since the bourgeoisie was identified uh, with, 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 with not only with conversos but with the Jews. And this has to do, this immediately uh, connected people with deep ideas of Jewish debased materiality. Uh, in fact, what, what I try to claim that here in, we are facing here not only a, 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 an historical, uh, very uh, you know, circumstantial problem of aristocracy versus bourgeoisie, but be, beyond the scenes, we have also a more theological, political problem. How to conceive these people who were at the same time Catholics and Hebrews to be positive? from an economic theological point of view. And this, this was unsurmountable. This, yeah. Ora? Actually, I wanted to follow up, uh, to follow what the Larry said, uh, but from another angle, and to say that uh, in, in late antiquity, um, transgenderism and uh, and conversion uh, appear in, genre, in, in a geographical genre, especially, but from the other side, especially about uh, how lots, women prostitutes, who convert to Christianity and become nuns, but then they dress like men, because you can be a good Christian only as a man, and this is, of course, some uh, this literature, and we have several stories like this. I think I know of six at least, and very famous ones. Uh, um, stories of uh, transvestism, not uh, not becoming a man, but uh, dressing as a man, um, uh, express the fears of uh, of monks uh, from from from. Actually, from the from the from the monastery community, who knows who is hiding there uh, among the uh, but but the, but but the motive of uh, someone that uh, the, the change of heart makes on also the change of body at least uh, the exterior is a, a very old uh, uh, genre in Christianity. What's so interesting the contrast here, and I think it has to do with. with with identification of what is true religiosity. So apparently late Christianity, like the good Christian, is like identified with masculinity. Yes. And of course in the 19th century you have like increasingly coming up religiosity, true religiosity, piety, sensitivity is identified with women. Mm -hmm. So not only like in, in occultism and spiritualism, like most mediums that there are women. But also, like even in Catholicism, like you get this more this emphasis on, on on Mary and femininity. So this is also like one track you could go, like this identify this this, this gender <coughs> transformation in it, at least in my specific, not my personal, but Schreiber's case. Yeah? So identify it with 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 his his identification of, of true religiosity, sensitivity towards the superhuman with being a woman. So yeah, that would be also yeah, that would be taking the cultural track. So what what values are associated with masculinity? So therefore, why should women want to become masculine also the other way around? And it's really nice that these are basically opposite. Uh, yeah. And it would be interesting also today to to basically see what cultural language do people do, do men give to want to become women, and what cultural language do women 
give to become male? Because today, like both directions exist, and it would be really interesting to, to yes, look into. But without religion, so much. Yeah, but the religion is one cultural language, so I, I wouldn't really mind if it's given another form than, than, than religion. I don't think there's an essential difference between them. May I ask another question um, about the merchants? Because I worked once about the mm -hmm. very famous Mallorca. and, yeah, and merchant, uh, but, uh, an ancestor of uh, this merchant, uh, a merchant from uh, Majorca, and, uh, late the 13th century who was a missionary merchant and uh, actually who was very, according to, to the book written about him, was very successful in, uh, in uh, converting Jews in, um, in the Mediterranean. He was from, uh, from Italy, but he worked in the Mediterranean. And uh, one of the things that comes up from this very interesting treatise is that uh, they say that uh, because he is a merchant, he is such a good missionary because he knows how to make these small steps towards the other side and convert them. He is not like a priest who goes, you know, blows in the, in, the, in the face, but he knows how to. So do you have this? Uh, this idea of a mission, missionary merchant who is good in, in commerce and good in, 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 in also in influence uh, others. The art of the deal. <laughs> <laughs> the art of the deal. Yes, the art of the deal. <laughs> Not written by Trump. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think uh, also Carson has to to answer because at least in, in my in my talk I I I I I, I, re, I refer to representations and not to actual to actual encounters. But indeed looking through for instance uh, inquisitorial archives you see the merchant the merchant who is who is acting very often as an agent. Mm -hmm. uh, moreover, uh, uh, my friend uh, uh, Carsten mentioned Israel Salvatore Riva, and in one of his uh, very important articles, he mentioned concerning the uh, crypto Jews only that there were two channels through which crypto Judaism was transmitted the house and the profession. And the profession meant, uh, of course, the same profession but especially on the ways the, the merchants whether going together to a fair or, 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 or encountering others they, they could speak out loud what in their towns it was much more dangerous and of course they have a kind of male socialization who could you know, be propitious to speak about, about those things that, yes Yes, yeah, but I would also like to add that in the uh, inquisitorial documents that seems to be something very standard that uh, merchants of different uh, religious persuasions exchange their respective views and try, try to bring the other one over to one's own religion. It never works, but it is a kind of ritual, even between these, these neighbors in Bordeaux, for example who uh, tackle each other over and over again over the years, but uh, it seems to be a way of affirming boundaries as well, mm. between, between merchants who mingle and uh, <clears throat> have a need to, uh, to show who they are. My question is to Karsten and has to do with the last comment by, by Claude. It seems to me that uh, most of the cases that you have been presented, more than agents of conversion, what the Inquisition is looking after is agents of transmission. I think it's transmission what it worries them most. Uh, how come that this continues to be there and happen? No? Um, um, how is it, I, I have a particular case 
of a young woman from Sicily. It, it, it is not finished, it's just the beginning. But the inquisitors ask, how come you know uh, how to be a, a, a Jewish? Uh, who told you or who uh, included you in a Jewish link or transmission? Which I think it's connected with the other problem you mentioned, the complicidades. All these links form a, 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 a drama, a complicidad, which worries the inquisitors extremely because it's connected with deceit, as Professor Elia Dalton said. But it is connected to the fact that Judaizers keep Jews keep, keep being there, no matter the efforts they've been doing, the inquisitors, I mean. I think there is quite a difference in approach between the inquisitors and us historians. We see, of course, the new Christian as an ethnic substrate population in which, through many different anthropological channels, the uh, certain cultural uh, patterns were transmitted. But they were Catholics, they were scholastics, and they saw them as Baptist Christians like anybody else. So they would not see I, I, I them disagree. as growing up in the... I disagree. I think that one of the biggest problems in early modern Iberia is that they start believing uh, that baptism is transforming anyone. And in fact, they write, for example, on the Moriscos, they are baptized but not Christians. Um, and they speak about the inheritance of belief. So it is very mixed. Well, the way in which they gathered the information about the teaching of heresy uh, has this model in mind that everybody is born a Christian, needs a perverter, needs to be corrupted at a certain moment of their, of their life, and that one can say from where this perversion comes, and they should say exactly when it happened and who was responsible for it, which is a construction, and even probably the inquisitors themselves did not believe in it. But their own theolo theology forced them to ask their defendants these kinds of these kinds of questions and to look for agents of their uh, uh, of their heresy. And that's what we find in the documents. May I may I abuse my 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 my, my authority here? And I want to follow up on what Marcel said because what I, what I think maybe is underlying this because there is. Uh, uh, there is quite a compatibility between the talk that she gave this morning and, and yours. I mean, if you look at the, the people that you were talking about, uh, the one who were suspicious, uh, suspe uh, suspicious of being, uh, of being, uh, having weak spot for, Jude for Judaism or so, and these are the people who are going to the materials that, as Mercedes told, were at some point banned, but not only banned, but recognized to be of potential danger. And as the issue that she raises now, the, the issue of transmission, so maybe there is more to that in the sense that going into these places back is a place where you can you can dwell in this knowledge. I don't know exactly in what terms you can you can you can say that you are practicing it, but even being from the other side, in the sense that you're getting access to materials that are, are, are being are being forbidden to others, that even as you're as a proselyter, you're still in the area when you can when you can when you can reach out and touch the materials that are forbidden. I don't know, maybe it's, maybe it's too wild. It's like yeah. books or... Uh, books, or materials, or discussions, you discuss with people, you, 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 you have a chance to discuss uh, uh, people and, and get them out verdicts that we heard were, were, were prohibited to be read out loud in public because of their corrupting power. So mm -hmm. maybe there is another dimension of this of this uh, interrogator interroga uh, and, 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 sus and, uh, and, and suspect relations that, that enable more of a more of a subversive reading, even from the position of the one of authority of power. But I don't know, this is speculation. And maybe there is no such a big difference between an agent of conversion and a transmitter of knowledge. So maybe it's a fussy distinction uh, that is not always so clear cut, no? But I was not thinking of an ethnic uh, uh, transmission uh, more, uh, I was trying to think of what 
worries the Inquisition most. Uh, and I think transmission is one, and deceit is another. Yes, my, my, uh, well, my comment is not probably two doors, and you probably know some things that I have to say, but still, in the situation that he describes in Portugal, where the conversos are more or less identified, The situation Dobbs describes in Portugal, where the conversos are more or less identified as the merchants, uh, existed in a much, uh, on a much smaller scale in South Italy after the great conversion of the 13th century, on which I'm going to talk on, in this conference, but from a completely different aspect. Anyway, uh, the converts called first Neophyti, and still called Neophyti by ecclesiastical authorities and uh, other uh, other authorities, they are known in popular circles as mercanti. And they are the merchants par excellence in the southern kingdom where the bourgeoisie is relatively weak. And they participate in the, at international fairs, they deal in trade, they are identified as merchants and they address themselves to the authorities when they ask for sorts of concessions as merchants, which is a very interesting proto situation to that that which was created in Portugal uh, in the aftermath of the mass, mass conversion. Uh, what I would like to remark here is that, in fact, what we have in common is the conversion of a great number of people who remain identified as a group for various reasons. Even if they are considering themselves as good Catholics, this doesn't matter in itself, because they're still recognized as a specific group that survives for centuries, which is also true for Southern Italy. And it would be very interesting to look, uh, very interesting to look at the common factors why this happens in both places, and why they are always suspect of obtaining some Jewish identity, uh, which is maybe not really part of the, of the things they do, but it is as they are as they are perceived, and as in some cases the members of the Nassau tended to marry among themselves. This is also one of the accusations meted against the converse, the Neofiti, Mercanti of Southern Italy, even at least 150 years after their initial conversion. So this is just food for thought. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, just a quick comment. Uh, your papers uh, make me think about the fact that religious authorities recognize the, uh, the uh, everyday encounters and people and everyday people as agents of conversion, if we are using that phrase. All these uh, laws prescribing socialization between, uh, I mean, certainly Jews and Christians, uh, uh, dancing, eating together, and it's uh, both on uh, rabbinic and Christian Christian side. It seems like they they uh, in fact recognize that what you've been talking about in this daily, you know, between the sheets. Uh, Agents of conversion between the sheets, so to speak. So that's just like. Well, the specific case of this semi clandestine environment is that all those laws uh, cannot really uh, form boundaries between them because they're all uh, officially Christians. No, I, I want to, to, to add to, to the example. And and make just a comment to, to, to this particular uh, example by reminding perhaps some of you have had in mind what, for instance, Nathan Bachtel, uh, he found, he, he was not the first one, that among, among Mexican, Mexican conversos, the, the code to go and to gather and to do the eyes together was cro cro which meant to make sex. And, uh, and I think that, that, that uh, we have to explore a little more in a, almost a quasi-psychological, anthropological way. What does it mean to Judaize and to have sex yeah, in terms of clandestinity and intimate love? I, I think that there is, beyond the specific case you mentioned, perhaps, perhaps, maybe, 
too, too gender, dangerous. Gender language, like it's a, and it's, it's more than gender language. It's yeah. the the embodiment of 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 to fulfill a clandestine life. Yes. Moreover, there is the theological framework of the union between the Jews and the Gentiles as a kind of this kind of union. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. A lot of place to play there on. Well, then? Well, it would be much more mundane, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> more anyway. than that? Really titillating. I just want to note, and again, this is a small point, but I get a certain amount of satisfaction because the theme of the, the, the trader merchant as uh, agent of conversion you know, echoes what I was trying to say this earlier today. So, uh, and I hadn't really thought it out. You know, all of a sudden somebody asked, and I, you asked, I think, and talked about the Soviets. So here we are. Now, the other profession that, that merchants, or the other job, the other part-time job that merchants do, are spies, of course. And um, this brings us back to kind of sign views and um, or keeping their identity secret and things like that. So, what kind of espionage, agents of conversion, secret practitioners of religion? And occasionally even selling and buying, and um, so it's, I think it's all very interesting. What? So if, if you were late, then you're talking about titillating uh, aspects, and I want to throw this idea that converters, merchants, and uh, people who uh, I guess recruit, recruit. recruit uh, spies, all three share a certain uh, skills, I would say. A, the ability to learn very quickly and very thoroughly another person's culture. And B, to speak the, uh, the, the language and identify certain emotional uh, traits that you can manipulate, whether you want to sell something, whether you want to sell a product, whether you want to sell a, a, <coughs> an idea or a religion. Um, and lastly, that there is this motivation to manipulate somebody else. And, and, and you find that, that people who deal with conversion, or people who want to sell, or people who want to recruit spies, have a very manipulative position vis-a-vis -vis other people, and have very uh, interesting set of skills that are very similar, and that they put them into practice when, when they do whatever that uh, they want. So this was just like uh, continuing this issue of where, where do converters, merchants, and recruitments of spy work. But, but this is one, one, the, one of the faces of Janus. The other is, uh, the, the other is uh, communication. Communication. And you have, if, if, we, are, if we, are, we are speaking about early modern times, there is a, an increasing awareness of the importance of communication. Then, basically speaking, whereas in, 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 the, in, the, in the medieval imagination, the society was, was imagined as a body with organs, during the early modern times, people began to speak as blood and nerves, as important part to connect between the different parts of the political body. And this is precisely the role of the merchants. This is what Simone Luzzato said concerning Venice, that the Jews are the blood of, of the Venetian Republic. And this is what uh, Gomez Solis said, that the merchants, that is the commercial merchants, were the nerves of the Republic. Is to say it's a good way, you know, to solve the problem. The conversions on their Jews, there are no uh, a clear status within the mystical body, the Christian mystical body. But by being merchants, you put them not outside, but in between. Mm -hmm. And here we have a very interesting way in which, of course, being merchants, spy, and even de facto missionary, has a, could have some of legitimation. Yeah. That's maybe an additional reason for economical reason that merchant communities have often protected status, which of course enables them even more to, to act. I know at least from the Dutch case, Jewish community, no, they were not Jewish. The Portuguese community could do whatever they want, including keeping slaves, because they had this protected, protected economical status. And if you even add your argument, there's even another reason, in addition to economical reasons, to give protection to the merchants if they're the, the, the blood, the, the, the lifelines of, of, of a republic or a state. 
Okay. Last question for today, Elena? So it's sort of more of a comment speaking to things that have been circulating. Um, in responding to your idea of um, the agent of conversion as the seller, makes me think of the buyer, right? And part of what we're seeing is people on the other side, those who are being converted or attracted to the idea, are people who are trying to join a network, whether it's a trade network or maybe on the frontier, you know, attracted to the network of what connection to whatever world that is expanding and is that uh, is perceived as the um, source of power and economic success. So putting in another way your idea of associating commercialization with religion. Uh, we have time for another quick one. And I have a final comment which is that at some point this morning, um, Brian's view of conversion seemed very far outside of the models of conversion that we are used to talking about. And I think by the end of today, we've circled all the way around and sort of drawn a circle around it so that we are back to talking about conversion as something that happens first and foremost in the body, whether that is sort of through the bodies of your agents or between the sheets or in some broader way in the body politic or the body mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, we seem to have a more integrated picture than we had. Can I just add one morning. more thing? And it's, it's, it's to your comment. So, not only not only the idea that that there's something to be gained by this in sort of commercial kinds of terms, but among the Guarani, there's much to be feared if they're outside of the network that they are able to create with the with the uh, with the Jesuits, because of course they're assailed by slavers on one side, by the encomenderos on the other, the people who would take merciless advantage of them. And being inside the mission is a place where they can be relatively safe and they can often usually avoid this fate, which is which is then what leads to the idea that the missions are somehow autonomous from the rest of commercial society. And the Jesuits explicitly say this is a place where money does not circulate. And although they do have Indians going back and forth to Buenos Aires, the idea is that this is a place where commerce does not enter because we know that commerce will end up with the bodies of Indians in the hands of the, the people who really don't care very much about religion, the, the settlers. Different kind of network. All right, thank you. I want to thank all the participants. Yes.